This morning's platform is called Overcoming Adversity, Becoming an Advocate with Jeffrey Deskovich. Jeffrey Deskovich, Esquire, MA, is an attorney who founded the Jeffrey Deskovich Foundation for Justice, which has freed 11 wrongfully convicted people and helped pass nine laws aimed at preventing such injustices. An advisory board member of the National Coalition Group, It Could Happen to You, which has branches in New York, Pennsylvania, and California, all of which he is active in. Jeff also sits on the Global Advisory Council of Restorative Justice International. Jeff's motivation is that he served 16 years in prison from the age seven of 17 to 32 for a murder and a rape that he did not commit prior to being exonerated via DNA evidence that identified the actual perpetrator. Jeff considers that his purpose in the world is to fight wrongful conviction and for broader criminal justice reform. His body of work includes delivering several hundred presentations nationally and internationally, authoring more than 200 articles while being published in nine different publications, regularly meeting with elected officials in New York, Pennsylvania, and California, and doing countless print, radio, television, and media interviews. Jeff has delivered many CLE presentations, spoken in front of police cadets, groups of prosecutors, police, and judges. Twice caught a wrongful conviction class as an ad adjunct pr professor, he has served on the Peekskill Police Task Force Reform Group and on the transition team of the Westchester County DA, co-owner of the Recharge Behind, Beyond the Bars Reentry Game, a documentary short about his life post-exoneration and advocacy work named Conviction is available on Amazon Prime. He has received numerous awards, including the Humanitarian of the Year Award, the 2018 Distinguished Alumni, Private Sector Servant of Justice, Advocate of the Year. His endorsement as an individual has been given in 12 political races where wrongful convic conviction prevention and criminal justice reform were part of the planks that candidates were running on. We are so excited and pleased to introduce Jeffrey Deskovich. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay. Um, so as was mentioned, um, I was uh, arrested in 1990 uh, for uh, a murder uh, and rape, which I did not commit. Um, I was 16 years old. Uh, this is my mugshot. So we're not, I was not the adult then uh, that, you see, uh, that you see me um, today. So actually being arrested uh, for something that I didn't, that I didn't do, uh, itself, I consider to be uh, significant uh, adversity. Um, I'm going to show another photo. This is a picture of me in the courtroom after it was announced that the jury had reached a verdict, but prior to the uh, verdict uh, having been announced. So the verdict, despite the uh, presence of a trial negative DNA test result, was that based on a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, terrible public defender, uh, I was wrongfully convicted. I have been charged as an adult, tried as an adult, and therefore sentenced as an adult. This is what I looked like in the courtroom uh, when I was given the uh, 15 to life sentence. Needless to say, that, that was definitely a significant uh, adversity. So I was sent to a men's maximum security prison, witness the, uh, the, the photo, where beyond just being a 17-year-old 
uh, an immense maximum security prison, which it's, uh, in and of itself was a significant adversity. Just thinking about the, that, that lifespan from 17 to 32 that I spent while I was wrongfully imprisoned, and just thinking about what that meant in terms of development, you know, uh, meaning stages of life and growth. Uh, I miss births, deaths, weddings. Uh, I didn't go to the high school. I didn't, I didn't graduate high school. No, I didn't finish my education at a more traditional age. I did, was not able to get myself established in a, in a career. Uh, I was not able to uh, marry, start a family. All those things that typically go, go on um, in people's lives in general between um, age 17 and, and 32. So having that developmental portion of my life spent uh, while wrongfully in prison was definitely a significant adversity. But it went far beyond that. I had to repeatedly fight off feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, thoughts of giving up, uh, suicidal ideation. All of that was adversity. While I was wrongfully imprisoned, I tried to minimize the loss that I was experiencing. I got a GED, I got an associate's degree, I completed an additional year towards the bachelor's degree. But then that silver lining was taken from me because the funding of college education for prisoners uh, was cut. So yet, yet another uh, adversity, uh, paling compared to the things we've already talked about, but an adversity nonetheless. Uh, I lost seven appeals. Those were all significant adversities. I'll show you another picture of me in uh, prison. When my appeals were over. The only way back into court is if you could find an attorney and an investigator who will take your case for free, and then if they can find some previously unknown evidence of innocence, then you can get back into court. But other than that, when your appeals are over, that's it. It is, it, is, uh, it is what it is. So I didn't have any money to hire an attorney or an investigator. My family didn't have any uh, money for that either. And so I wrote letters for four years, rarely getting responses other than the occasional no. I, I consider those four years to be an extreme time period of, of adversity. I went to the parole board after 15 years. But because I maintained my innocence rather than expressing remorse and taking responsibility, I was denied parole. And so I ended up having to do an additional year uh, on top of that. They ordered me to do two years. But I wound up doing one more year instead, uh, bringing the total to 16 years. Uh, I was exonerated through further DNA testing. I, one of my letters ultimately, because I had to never give up uh, mindset, and one of the letters that I sent out uh, to a book author and care of a publishing company was instead sent to an investigator uh, who ultimately connected me uh, to the Innocence Project, a nonprofit organization that frees wrongfully convicted people in cases where DNA testing can demonstrate innocence. So getting their representation was the first key uh, the district attorney of Westchester, uh, Jeanine Pirro, she had left office. She's the one who had blocked me from getting further testing. So her successor was willing to allow me to get further testing. Um, so Pirro leaving office was the second key out of three. And the third key being that they took the crime scene DNA evidence, which already didn't match me, and they entered it into the DNA data bank. And it matched the actual perpetrator whose DNA was only in the data bank um, because left free while I was doing time for his crime, he killed a second victim just three and a half years later, who was a school teacher uh, with two children. So this uh, photo is, um, we're looking at right now is a photo of when I was uh, released. Um, this is my attorney, Barry Sheck, to my left. There's my mother next to me, whose hand I'm holding, and uh, Nina Morrison, my primary attorney at the Innocence Project. Um, I've showed another photo on the screen. This is my uh, first uh, hug with my mother uh, in the, in the uh, free world uh, in uh, 16 years. A lot of times when we think about people who are exonerated, we feel the mixed emotion of the horror, but also the elation that they're free now, that their injustice is over. And we frequently envision, most of us, that it's... Uh, life happily ever after. But that's not actually the reality. My adversities continued on the street as I'm about to illustrate to you. 
It was very difficult to put your life back together again after a traumatic experience like that, particularly one that lasted for 16 years and particularly one that spanned uh, from age 17 to 32. So in no particular order, I had to deal with the psychological after effects of my experience. It's typical that people who have been wrongfully imprisoned have suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome. They have related symptoms of panic attacks and anxiety. There's a feeling of having been frozen in time. So I was released when I was 32, but I felt like I was 17 because that was the age that I was when I was last free. I had a feeling like I was processing things at a slower speed than the rest of uh, other people out here in the world. And there was, definitely was uh, fear on seeing law enforcement. There was a stigmata of it. I was in prison wrongfully for 16 years. Yes, but I was there for 16 years. So how much of that rubbed off on me? Was it safe to be alone someplace with me? So when it came to personal relationships, uh, having been wrongfully in prison for 16 years definitely presented a significant obstacle. There was the technological aspect of it. GPS, cell phones, internet had not been created, um, hadn't been in existence rather, when I was originally arrested. Those had all been created while I was wrongfully imprisoned. The culture was different. Neighborhoods looked just similar enough to look dissimilar. And it was totally different people now that lived in those neighborhoods. So taken cumulatively, I felt like I was in a parallel world, a world that I didn't belong in. I was released with nothing, as, as everybody is who is exonerated. You, New York State does provide compensation, but you have to obtain an attorney, and it's a legal process. It ended up taking me five years before I was compensated. So I was left on my own. There was no help for me to get from point A to point B. So I, always, I was always passed over for gainful employment because the technology had passed me by, and it seemed like all of the would-be employers wanted somebody who could hit the ground running. There seemed to be little to no patience for any type of on-the-job training. So I struggled to have income coming in. I was making money doing speaking engagements, but that's not a consistent form of income. I was a columnist for a weekly newspaper. I was paying quite well per article, but the issue is it was a weekly newspaper. So obviously they only wanted one per week. So I struggled to have uh, money coming in and as a result of that, I lacked stability of housing. I bounced around from place to place, and at one point uh, came a couple of weeks away from being in a homeless shelter. Uh, Mercy College, which had agreed to give me a scholarship to finish the bachelor's degree because that item had made its way into the newspaper as a human interest item associated with my uh, wrongful conviction and exoneration, so Mercy College which had offered me the scholarship to finish the bachelor's degree. When I lost my temporary housing, they upped the ante and they allowed me to live on campus. It was awkward when I would meet up with members of my extended family who had um, never come to see me while I was incarcerated and the few that did uh, would come disappear for three years, come disappear for three years. But in general, they, people didn't come. I, I, for, for most intents and purposes, I did the I did the time uh, by myself, and as a result of that, when I would meet up with members of my extended family, it would be an awkward experience because I knew who they were intellectually from memories when I was younger. But I was a different person now, and so were they, and I couldn't relate to them, and nothing in their background would have allowed them to understand what it was to be arrested for something you didn't do, to be wrongfully convicted of that, to do time in prison, to go through all the difficulties of reintegration. And I remember how incredibly lonely it was and how, you know, at times I did, I did think about um, suicidal ideation. I did fight off depression uh, in my life post exoneration. So this next photo that I'm gonna throw on the screen kind of encapsulates all of those struggles coming together in one, one moment. It all just came together and it was, it was too much. It was too much. But while I was undergoing uh, all of those difficulties, uh, I did get the scholarship uh, for Mercy College, so I did finish the bachelor's degree. 
Uh, I did become an advocate. I gave a two, two and a half hour off the cuff presentation at the press conference when I was released. Everything I ever wanted to say in 16 years but could never get anyone to hear all came out. And just as I thought I was wrapping up, another topic dawned on me. And so I kept going and I thought I was done and another topic and so on and so forth. And so uh, at the end of that two, two and a half hour off the cuff uh, presentation, a light bulb went off and I realized, you know, I could be an advocate. I don't necessarily have to be an attorney to be part of the innocence movement. And so uh, I began my speaking career, I began writing articles and I decided to trade privacy for awareness by doing uh, television, print, radio, and ultimately new media uh, interviews. I began meeting regularly with elected officials. So I did that for uh, five years while I was undergoing all those uh, difficulties. So I guess in a way you could say I continued to slog through the adversities that I was experiencing while trying to do something positive for my life amidst all the pain and suffering. After about five years, <clears throat> I was able to receive some financial compensation. So it was kind of at a moment, you know, I had only really been able to nibble on the edges when it came to wrongful conviction. Yeah, plenty of policy work, plenty of public education, but my work in terms of trying to help free people was more limited to things like somebody's attorney might ask to put my name in a press release to get more media information. They might ask me to help pack the courtroom. They might want me to come into court for the visual effects so the judge could see me, maybe recognize me, realize I'm supporting a particular case and therefore pay just a little bit more closer attention to the matter in front of them. But that's all kind of nibbling on the edges. I wanted to, so the moment the question became, did I want to just continue at the level that I was, that I want to try to ramp this thing up, that I want to try to really get in directly involved in, in, in freeing people. And so when I had some of the financial compensation, decided, you know, it was, it was now or never, you really, how far are you going to go? And I wanted to go in, I wanted to go all in. And so I used some of the money to start the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, whose purpose would be to free people and to continue the policy work that I was doing uh, as an individual advocate, but just uh, from a nonprofit perspective with a support staff. Um, so this photo uh, shows uh, opening day uh, of the foundation. Uh, in terms of uh, frequency of wrongful conviction, uh, per the National Register of Exoneration, uh, from 1989 forward to now, more than 3,100 uh, people uh, across the U.S. Uh, have been exonerated. And so to illustrate that frequency of wrongful conviction, in order to show that my case is not this one-off anomaly that rarely happens, even just by means of looking at this photo, a uh, gentleman to my right, Fernando Bermudez of Manhattan, which we're in the Ethical Cultural Society of Manhattan, uh, 18 years uh, before exonerating, being exonerated, um, he was misidentified by uh, five people. Uh, to the left of me, uh, bald head, um, dark skinned gentleman, Jabbar Collins, uh, did 16 years before being exonerated. And right behind to him, well, actually to the left of him, you might recognize Raymond Santana, also from Manhattan in the Central Park Five uh, case. So the foundation has been able to um, free um, 11 people, and we did, um, we did help pass nine laws, uh, three of them. Um, were videotaping interrogations, uh, identification reform, DNA database. Uh, and I'm gonna get to the others in a second, but in terms of the people we were able to free, the 11 people we were able to free, uh, first person on the board here uh, was William Lopez, who did 23 and a half years on a shotgun murder in Brooklyn. Uh, Mr. Lopez had a pre-existing legal team who had been with him for nine years, but we came in in the last year of his case and did some investigative work. And it's kind of like a building was built, but was missing a section and we helped put that in. Uh, so he was uh, exonerated after 23 and a half years. Um, Mr. Lopez passed away after a year and a half of uh, freedom. Second person we helped exonerate uh, to my left with red tie, uh, William Hawhey. Uh, who did eight years and four months in an electrical fire. Well, excuse me, if we're an arson case, that was actually an electrical fire. Uh, we were able to do that case completely in-house. We got the Putnam County District Attorney to agree with us um, that he was, um, he was innocent. 
uh, earlier in the introduction, it was mentioned that I sometimes do presentations um, internationally. Uh, this was an example of me. Um, I, I did a speaking event in the uh, country of Armenia. This was a press conference ahead of time. I was working with advocates on the ground. It's a relatively new democracy there. At the time of this, they were like 30 something years old and you know, government really didn't believe that there was anything uh, called the wrongful conviction, certainly not a false confession. So um, I was kind of a media interest, but look, it advanced the cause. And so I went there and I rolled up my sleeves and I did it. Uh, but uh, other, other work um, that, I, that I did uh, was with a coalition group called It Could Happen to You. And we were able to pass an additional uh, five laws in New York, including the uh, first, country's first oversight commission called the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct. So I'm getting an award here by the founder of um, It Could Happen to You, um, Bill Bastic, with the long red tie and his colleague, uh, fellow member of the coalition, um, Professor Gershman. So we did that and we helped to pass discovery law, which pertains to sharing information uh, early in the process automatically uh, with, um, between the prosecutors and the defense. But we have the chapters in um, Pennsylvania. So this is our Pennsylvania team. So this photo kind of speaks also to the frequency of wrongful conviction. So gentleman in the tan with the baseball cap is Drew Whitley, who did 20 years before DNA exoneration. And next to him, Terrence Lewis, who did 21 years and four months. And then next to me uh, is uh, Mark Whitaker, who did uh, 21 years and seven months. Uh, in the front with the black is Karen Mills, whose um, husband, John Bookins, who's done uh, 30 years so far in Pennsylvania, just trying to get a DNA test, just trying to give me the testing so I can try to demonstrate my innocence, but uh, the uh, Commonwealth uh, not wanting to give in. And to her left with the glasses in the back, uh, Marianne Lubis, uh, part of the It Could Happen to You uh, team in Pennsylvania. Uh, she's here, actually here with us in attendance. Uh, maybe she can come up for just a brief second and just wave for a second to everybody. She came here from, from Pittsburgh. So thank you very much for working, working with us. Um, so in Pennsylvania, we were able to help pass an expungement bill uh, so that's our track record. You know, at at uh, at some point, I became uh, not satisfied with sitting in the front row of the courtroom. I wanted to be able to sit at the defense table, represent some of the clients, make some of the arguments. Uh, hence, a foray into law school. Experienced adversity there. I didn't get in first time I tried, but I tried back again um, seven years later. You know, I consider the fight against uh, wrongful conviction to be about justice and accuracy, not anti-law enforcement. Uh, definitely against cops and prosecutors who violate state and federal constitutional rights, who behave in an unethical way and otherwise cause injustice. Definitely against them. And no, it's not a few bad apples. Yet, nonetheless, it's not all of them either. Um, so I've spoken uh, twice a year at, at police cadets. So I, I have some buy-in on the end of law enforcement and that's what the purpose of this photo is. Next photo is um, is um, when I graduated the master's from John Jay College and here's getting the sorry, I went, uh, law degree. So in terms of the foundation's work now, uh, you know, we um, so we're pursuing some legislative reforms here in, in New York, which I'd love you to contact your elected officials about. We have the uh, Challenging Wrongful Convictions Act, which would provide an attorney for people who are seeking uh, post-conviction proceedings. So I, I shouldn't have had to write letters for four years trying to get someone to take my case for free. You know, the state should have provided me with an attorney. So that's in the bill. And another thing in the bill would, uh, the way the law is now, anyone that's pled guilty, and we, and we know innocent people have pled guilty, Let's say you get a terrible lawyer, you plead guilty of something you didn't do, just in a damage control, you decide to take the 5 to 15 rather than going to trial, losing and getting 25 years. Now, subsequent to that, you wind up with a good attorney that finds good evidence for you. And now that attorney is not able to argue actual innocence because you pled guilty. They're stuck doing the mental gymnastics. And this is happening to me now in the Omar Clark case. Uh, where I have to argue that the evidence shows that there was inadequate investigation by the prior attorney. So the Challenging Wrongful Convictions Act would uh, prevent that. It would allow an actual innocence. It would allow newly discovered evidence. So that's an important thing that we're trying to do now. Uh, in terms of the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct, we passed the bill. We got the governor to put money in the state budget. The issue 
is that the governor, the speaker of the house, the president of the Senate, the minority leader in the assembly, the minority leader in um, the, well, the Senate and assembly, no, nobody's made their picks. If commissioners aren't picked, the commission can't begin its work. So that's trying to get that last leg of the journey so the commission could be up and running as part of it. Um, in terms of interrogations, there's the Youth Interrogation Act. I never understood my rights. As a 16-year-old being read my rights, every time they said everything you can and will be used against you in a court of law, my mind went to civil court. I'm thinking, court, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? We're not, we're not going to court. What are you talking about? But I had no idea, and neither do other people my age. So anyone 16 or 17 should be able to speak with a lawyer to explain their rights to them before they decide whether or not they're going to waive them. So those are a couple of measures that we're working on. In Pennsylvania, there is no compensation. So we're working on trying to, one of 12 states that has no compensation. So working with Marianne Lubis and other colleagues in Pennsylvania on that. Uh, we have 17 cases uh, now that we're working on. I've entered some of those cases as uh, co-counsel. Others began before that. Uh, so there was one case that began that predated my law license. Um, we screened the case. We brought really good attorney on board, take, take the case pro bono. And then when I got the law license, the attorney circled back around to me and said, Jeff, we really would like you to enter the case as co-counsel. And so uh, here with us uh, this morning at um, Ethical is um, a woman who survived uh, 27 years wrongful incarceration, we're working to exonerate her. We helped get her on parole. The next step is to try to exonerate her. We're waiting for the results of a DNA test. I'd just like Carolyn Warmus to stand up just for a second, please, and just wave to the crowd. So in terms of ways to get involved, and I'm like two minutes from wrapping up, uh, in terms of ways to get involved, uh, I'll go general, then I'll go specific. Uh, in terms of general, definitely contacting your elected officials and expressing support for the measures that I just measured, uh, other bills that would uh, prevent uh, wrongful conviction. Uh, don't get out of jury duty. Did, did, did everybody hear me? Do not get out of jury duty. Serve on the jury, okay, and put the prosecution to its burden of proof. If they really meet that, you know which way to vote. But if they don't, that means you vote not guilty. So too many people get out of get out of jury duty, um, vote, it matters. It matters who's in office, um, vote for candidates that are in favor of um, criminal justice reform, wrongful conviction prevention, vote out the ones that are against that. And look, no, no one party has a monopoly on this. If, regardless of what, if someone's running on that plank and they have a body of work that suggests that, you know, they believe in this, they're not just coming up with it in order to get elected, that should be who you vote with if you vote for, if you care about um, these issues. And in terms of the foundation, you know, it, um, you know, it, uh, it takes money to do these cases, unfortunately. You know, we need, we're at our capacity now. We're not even taking new cases. We would like to be able to free more innocent people, you know. Um, so, but we need, you know, we have to need money to hire lawyers, paralegals, investigators, other essential personnel. If candidates of both parties can raise tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on what they refer to as low dollar donors, why can't we do that when it comes to freeing wrongfully convicted people? So in terms of the foundation itself, we do have our Patreon page. You know, we're asking, looking for 25,000 people who would willing, be willing to sacrifice three to $5 a month on a recurring monthly basis. That would give us close to a million dollars. We could certainly work on freeing a lot more people and pushing policy changes in more than just the uh, three states we're currently, um, currently working in. When there are wrongful conviction events, then definitely come. Uh, sign petitions when they come around. And my last point I'm going to make, and I'm going to open for Q&A, uh, I want to share with you the, my uh, universal formula that I, that I came up with um, for ov overcoming adversity and helping other people. And this is far beyond just uh, wrongful imprisonment. You know, it can apply to family members of homicide victims. It can apply to um, women, victim of um, domestic uh, abuse, people who've been trafficked, people who've faced uh, discrimination. Uh, you name the adversity can apply. So here it is. Have a goal. Have a realistic plan. You should be able to look at your realistic plan three or four different ways and say to yourself, yeah, I could see how that might work. Because who wants to carry out a plan that you don't think has a chance to work? 
Be flexible. Remember, the goal's the goal. The plan's not the goal. That's just the way to get there. So if in the course of you carrying out your plan, a different door opens, and as long as it's advancing you towards that goal, be flexible and walk through that door, accept that help. Don't be afraid of hard work. I believe that people that put themselves in a position for a miracle to happen are more likely to catch lightning in a bottle as opposed to doing nothing at all and just waiting for it to just drop in your lap while, while you do nothing. No excuses. There might be reasons why a goal is more difficult to do, but no excuse why it can't be done. It's all a matter of, you know, how much do you want it? Are you willing to leave it all out on the field? Never give up. That's the last part of it. And say to yourself, and I do this, to, I, I, I apply all of this to myself. When I can't go any further, I say to myself, you know, maybe this is the key moment right here, right now. Maybe I was on the verge of a breakthrough, but because I quit, it's not gonna happen. So even though I can't go on anymore, I'm going to go on anyway, just to see what happens on the other side. And then once you cross the other side and you make it, reach back for people in the same position that you were in. It'll make your suffering count for something. It'll be healing, it'll be cathartic, it'll give you meaning, and it'll help make the world just a little bit better. Thank you. If we have two questions, first, thank you. When, when someone goes before, the first question is, when someone goes before the parole board and says, I'm innocent, and they know that they'll get extra time for not doing it, wouldn't that have some impact? And before you answer that, the second question is, if you've been out about a dozen years now? 16 years, I've been home 16 years now. Have you been able to shed remove all the coats of protection that you carried while you were inside are you able to how are you is what i'm asking okay so let me deal with the second question and then i need you i'll need you to repeat the first question in a second i can't i can't hold it all in my head even though i just did that long presentation um <laughs> um so am i able to shed the uh the coats the protection how am i um Look, I think, and David, you know, you, you've known me for 16 years now. You, you know, you met me uh, shortly after I was um, released with um, Barbara Allen and some of the other uh, people in the room. So I would say I'm a totally different person now. I've shed a lot more of the cobwebs as, each, as more time goes by. I feel more readjusted. I've done a ton of work with uh, mental health professionals. That's happened. That's helped me a lot. I've learned a lot about the technology. So I feel more um, tied into the world now, feel less of a, less of a stranger. Uh, in, in terms of um, leaving things behind, maybe that was your, was your question. So while I was in prison, I learned and understood the prison mores, the, 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 the slang, uh, what was expected and not expected, not just from the prison administration, but the other prisoners. So I, I did all that to survive. I understood it all so I could navigate my way, but I never internalized those values as my own. So I think that that, I think that, that helped a lot. And when I when I was released, I did things to try to further get out whatever was there. Like I made a conscious effort to not use the prison slang anymore. I forced myself to break some of the habits from prison. So for example, uh, in prison, you always want to keep everybody in front of you. So you want to have your back to the wall. So when I would go to uh, a restaurant, I was always pick the seat um, on back to the wall, but I forced myself to do the other way in order to further you know, in order to further get out of that. So those are my, um, those are my answers to your questions. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, yeah, let me answer the question about parole. So listen, I think that standing, I think that standing on my innocence was um, part of the um, best thing that I ever um, did. Um, I, I, I encourage people, if someone goes to the parole board, so the general order of the day, as you know, if you don't express remorse and take responsibility, 
you know, they're probably going to deny parole and that's going to, um, you know, they're probably going to uh, deny you and now you have an extension of an already unjust prison sentence. But I, despite that, that, despite that being the general order of the day, more people, more and more people are uh, breaking through. You know, so I think if, I think you should maintain your innocence at the parole board. I think if you can have someone write a letter, even if it's not an attorney, just explaining primary and secondary reasons for belief in your innocence and asking them not to hold the uh, assertion of innocence against you. Uh, we've been able to get uh, five people home that way. Um, so I would encourage people to, I would encourage people to do that. I know it's hard, but that would be my suggestion. Um, do you collaborate with the Innocence Project? Yeah, so the Innocence Project was the entity that, um, that, that exonerated me. I do collaborate with them on some of the policy work and uh, some of the uh, stuff with the media. Uh, I've not collaborated with them on, uh, on cases. Yeah. Uh, in building a coalition for criminal justice reform, who are the most unlikely coalition partners that you've encountered, people that you would not expect to partner with at all, uh, with an eye to keeping out for whom we should be working with? Right. That's a really good question. I've never gotten that one before. Uh, so certainly NYSUIT, which is um, you know, teachers, teachers Union. Uh, we've had um, uh, labor, so AFL-CIO, uh, people in the hotel and restaurant. Um, industry. So, in fact, when then Governor Cuomo was deciding whether he was going to sign the bill creating the Commission on Prosecutorial Conduct, we had arranged for um, people from the hotel and restaurant industry reached out to him, and he was, from what I understand, he was quite surprised. Well, what do you guys care about criminal justice reform? And their answer was, well, some of our members could get caught up in it. So, those would be some of the non traditional partners. Uh, but in addition to that, I think having the crime victims, crime victim family members is a really powerful voice. You can enlist them as well. And, you know, part of that is uh, the, the reach outs and the education. Look, we're not about getting people out that are guilty. We're trying to separate the guilt from the, from the, from the innocent. And so this we're all about justice. And so I think, I think that's part of the reach out. But there's certainly a really powerful voice that you can that, that you can include. So those would be some, those would be some suggestions. But also, uh, if you can get some in law enforcement, I mean, um, you know, not easy to do, but certainly not impossible. So I, I remember I spoke at a press conference that the Innocence Project put together, and they brought a high-ranking police officer uh, to the Albany legislature. He was from North Carolina to speak about videotaping interrogations, because, you know, there's always law enforcement pushback on that. But he was from a state where uh, once they went to videotaping, they realized that it made for better evidence and that it protected their officers from false allegations of coercion. So, so um, th that law enforcement, but also the you know cop to cop type of thing, also could be you know could be an unlikely um, uh, former prosecutors as well. And sometimes um, can reach out to them and have them in favor of. And the whole thing too is this: I mean, don't do some global litmus test because you'll work with nobody if you do that. Okay, just issue by issue. Can you work together on one narrow issue? Let's get that done. There's plenty of time to come back to the other stuff and disagree or argue whatever we're gonna do. But let's just deal with one issue at a time. Good morning and thank you for your remarks. Um, as you know, we're now entering the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here in New York City and in cities all across our nation, we have seen a troubling upsurge in violent crime. And of course, most people are aware of this and it's, there's been a lot of conversation about it. Do you all, can you offer any commentary about this phenomenon and what possibly could be done about it? And on the issue of um, uptick in violence during COVID-19, yeah. So to the extent that some crimes are economic crimes, uh, drug dealing, robbery, burglary, no, I think, I think a big mistake politically that we made, we, we, we asked people, you know, stay home, don't go to work, but and like hardly any money was dispersed. So I think that was, 
I think that was part of it. But I think a bigger issue related to that is there were a lot, there was a lot of um, unjustifiable deadly police force. There were a lot of shootings and police killings of, of civilians that happened to take place during the COVID-19 uh, era. Um, certainly George Floyd, part of that, not, not limited to him. Uh, so I think that that was, um, I think that was part of it. And then that did, you know, that did spark some, that did spark uh, some crime in and of itself. I mean, vandalism, property damage, uh, looting, you know, that was, that was, um, that was part of that. You know, one thing that I uh, advocate for that's part, could be part of a solution. You know, when I've spoken in, in front of um, law enforcement, you know, I explain to them, I say, you know, when member law enforcement's killed, Police come out strong. There's a big marches, demonstration, horrendous result when someone is killed without question. Where's all that when the police kill someone unjustifiably? Where, where's all that then? Or is it that only some lives matter, the others don't? And as long as we keep having that divide, then there's going to be the tension in the community. There's going to be the distrust of, 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 of the police. So I think that's I think that that's part of it. And I've spoken at rallies where I explain to people, you know, um, uh, I know why you're out here. And I, I look at wrongful conviction and um, police brutality, unjustifiable deadly police force. It's all part of the big, a big whole. You know, we don't have to look at it all uh, in, a, in a segmented way. So I agree with you being out here in, you know, exercising your First Amendment rights, you know, but when you engage in vandalism, when you engage in uh, property destruction, looting, etc. You're you're harming the cause that you're here for. You're, you're diluting it. It's not about your issues anymore. It's only about what's going on in the street. So I encourage people to go about things in a in a in a lawful way. So I just think all those things, and I do think that the the COVID nineteen fatigue, you know, that's also a part of it with a lot of this, the the unrest, and you know, we have the general struggle on mass incarceration, closed Rikers Island, many people dying on Rikers Island on, on, a, on a seemingly weekly basis. So I think people are getting tired. And so I think part of the solution is that we need to, we need our electeds, we need our appointeds, you know, to start directly addressing these issues. And we need more of us that are not electeds, that are not appointeds, we need, we need to organize. We need to organize more. We need to raise, raise our voices up more. We need to demonstrate in a, in a legal way. We need to sign petitions. We need to raise money. We need to vote the right people in. We need to make our voices heard. Because unfortunately, I think it's uh, few and far between the politician that is going to do the right thing for the right thing's sake. Only when it's votes tied to it and getting elected or getting reelected. When they realize we're not going to accept it anymore as is, that's when we'll see some change. Jeffrey, thank you so much for your and your foundation's amazing work. Um, the question is, uh, do you find time or uh, also to address um, issues for all of those who are in confinement? I'm thinking in particular of the this recent plague of voter oppression that's happening. I mean, are you supporting prisoners' rights to exercise this fundamental civil right, as well as to be free from physical abuse by prison personnel, as well as perhaps um, advocating for a total ban on solitary confinement. These kinds of things are, are you? Yeah, I can weigh in on those issues, sure. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, solitary confinement, you know, uh, the United Nations, the, 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 you know, considers it to be a form of torture. You know, I was in solitary confinement uh, once uh, for, t for, for uh, tw 28 days, you know, um, you, can't see the outside, there's no clock, you can control no lights, uh, you're totally dependent on the guards to feed you, can't purchase food items or hygienic items, um, you know, very limited property, anytime you leave your cell, it's, um, you're in handcuffs. The only time I knew what time of the day it was is if they had breakfast items on the food tray, and when they would pass by my cell, and a few times I was sleeping, and when they came by and they were feeding the prisoner in the cell next to me, and I woke up and, you know, they weren't really told me, be awake on time next time. And they wouldn't feed me. So all all those things and a lot more. And you know, giving people you know thirty days, sixty days, ninety days, half a year, one year, two years on uh, have as a result of uh, doing marijuana and dirty urine, showing that you, you did marijuana. 
Um, I just think it. I think that solitary confinement is definitely, definitely a form of torture. So, yeah, I, I'm with you uh, on on that. A lot of people are over sentenced as well. Uh, but there were a couple of. What were the other issues you were asking me about? Right to vote. Okay. Yeah. No. Well, l listen. I, look. I think I do believe that prisoners should be allowed to vote. I mean, they're certainly impacted by the decisions that are made by the elected officials. Why shouldn't their why shouldn't their voice uh, why shouldn't their voice count? You know. But lots of um, hysteria. You know. What's going to sky is falling. Sky is falling. What's going to happen if we allow them to vote? But you know, I, I believe strongly that look, we're in a democracy, so everybody's voice is supposed to be able to count. You answered partially what I wanted to say. Uh, a, a wrongful conviction is a horrible, horrible thing. What about the stigma that society puts on people who have been in prison? They can't get a job, they can't get housing. Yeah, right. So, so naturally, there's, um, yeah, so I do think that there is a stigma. There is a stigma with respect to people who are, um, you know, uh, who were incarcerated or not incarcerated now they were maybe they were not innocent maybe they were rightfully convicted but nonetheless you know they've turned their lives around their their home now and they're committed to a crime free life and we allow discrimination to happen you know you're banning people you're stopping people from getting gainful employment the temptation to return back to crime becomes you know that much uh, that much higher you know, um, but I feel like that also in terms of college education for prisoners, you know, is that it, you empower people to broaden their horizons. If you equip them for gainful employment, they have a much better chance at getting gainful employment and thus staying home when they're released. I mean, who do you want living next to you? Somebody that has no education that can't get a job, or do you want someone that's got an education and is able to get a job? Who do, who do you think is more likely to, you know, commit a crime again? You know, so... Yeah, I'm completely against, um, you know, discriminating against people from, you know, based on their uh, prior uh, record. Hi. Uh, I was curious about the, the system of justice in general, and there's a lot of bend towards keeping a conviction as is instead of kind of getting the right answer. I was curious in what you've seen, what drives that? Is it sort of the ego of the system, or is it a lack of resources, and they feel strapped that they don't have the time if they keep going back they'll never get any work done on current crimes yeah i think so i think i think part of it is part of its ego the system doesn't like to admit the error i think another part of it on the prosecutorial level is you know they're trying to protect their colleagues whether current or former whether they know them or even if they don't know them i think that's part of it i think that the uh judges don't want to undo the time and effort that went into getting a case up to up to that point, I think that that's uh, I think that's part of it. Uh, there is a there, they do have not enough resources, so the caseloads are too big. But then there's a tension in the justice system also um, between finality to conviction, meaning as you were saying, look, you, you had your day in court, you lost. You know how many times we're going to keep going through this? At some point, it's got to end. And that makes sense on a level. But what good is a final conclusion if that final conclusion is not accurate? So I think whenever there's an objective reason to do so, that should be when a case is uh, looked at. But that finality of conviction concept is what leads many judges to often rubber stamp deny appeals. Just like the other uh, problematic concept is proceduralism versus substance of justice. So I lost in federal court because my petition arrived four days late, uh, a lateness that was caused by the court clerk giving my lawyer the wrong information. So the court decided to dismiss my case based on those four days. But why should those four days be more important than the substance of justice? Were the facts and law on my, on my side or they, they were not? So that's, that's another part of it. And I, and I think that overall the judiciary, the role of the judiciary in allowing wrongful convictions to happen in the first place, not keeping suggestive identifications out as evidence, not suppressing coerced false confessions, that's part of it. But then the appellate judge is also not enforcing defendant rights when they, we do challenge these issues through the appellate process. So we need to shine the light on the judiciary uh, as, as well.
Thank you so much for sharing your story. It was very powerful. I just have a question on behalf of the family. My husband is serving a life without parole sentence mm. and he's already served 26 years. We have two daughters together. So I just wanna know how your family coped with it and what advice you would give to families, uh, myself specifically, on what we can do to abdicate for our incarcerated loved ones. Sure, so when you, when you send someone to prison, you definitely send their family uh, to prison as well. Uh, my mother used to tell me that the most difficult part of it would be when she would leave and she would go home and she knows she couldn't bring me behind. And uh, also just kind of related to that, just prison's a dangerous place and just fear she had of what, you know, what might, might um, go on in the prison. So that was part of it. Often this, the separation is difficult also. For some reason, New York State likes to incarcerate prisoners who are from the city and they're stuck in the prisons that are in upstate New York and the ones that are from upstate New York are put in the prisons closer to the city. And, you know, just thinking about the difficulties and financial costs and the impact on visitation that has, uh, and that's really working against all of our interests in, in society because family contact, community ties are important factors in making a successful transition to a crime-free life. Uh, in terms of advice to people in the situation that you, that you um, mentioned, uh, Timmy, you know, a lot of uh, no easy answers. I would say, I think if I was in that situation and getting somewhere in court, let's just assume for a second that that's the court part of it's off the table, then definitely uh, I would be looking at clemency. You know, um, that has a lot to do with, you know, disciplinary record, how many educational programs, how many therapeutic programs, you know, ha have you completed, get involved in as many of those self-improvement uh, programs as you can. Sometimes the prisons have organizations that benefit society in one way or another, whether it's a food drive, a toy drive, whatever it is, get involved in all of that stuff. Keep your nose clean. You want to demonstrate, hey, I'm changed. I'm, a re I'm somebody rehabilitated. So I think that is part of it. Certainly gathering letters uh, from organizations and individuals with some influence um, is, is part of trying to, you know, make it stick out. But, you know, there's a general log jam on clemency, you know, that um, was horrible under um, then Governor Cuomo. Um, DC let some people out on his way out the door. Uh, governor Hochul, nothing. So I think us pressing as a society, pressing the governor, hey, we want more people to, um, you know, be released on, on clemency. And clemency, by the way, is not saying someone's going to get away with something. It's, it's recognizing that either they were, it's a way of leveling out, of making the system more just. You know, maybe somebody was over sentenced or they're not the same person anymore that they were before. That's the whole purpose of clemency. And so there are some of us that are trying to push the governor. There are rallies sometimes you know, in terms of um, clemency. So I would encourage uh, getting involved in those things. So I would, um, I would, I would start there. And there are some entities that, that help a little bit with clemency. So again, just like li looking for legal help, really short, not more than two paragraphs, make your case, why should you get clemency? But you're really directing that uh, to an attorney or other professional that could help with the clemency application. So that's as far as I wanna get uh, now in this setting. Um, I just wondered if your foundation is working to increase the compensation that's awarded to the exonerated. Uh, that's not an issue we're working on. Um, now, let me say this. Now, New York State does not have a cap on it. That's actually decided by a judge. That's, um, that's really case by case um, in terms of the uh, court of claims. So in the compensation in New York that, that's, that's filed in the court of claims, uh, it's averaging around $3.5 million right now and it's, uh, cases are settling a lot uh, faster. Uh, that's separate and apart from a federal civil rights lawsuit, which is decided by a jury. But being as though there's no limit in place right now, um, pushing to up the limit, I mean, there is no limit now. That's more a matter on the, on the judge's uh, end of it. Thank you so much. It's a, 
amazing and inspirational story. And I do want to mention uh, that Jeffrey introduced Carolyn Warmus, who served 27 years in prison, who is here, with David Rothenberg, the founder of the Fortune Society. And together they are coming back here on November 6th. And they will be in conversation. And David will be um, talking to Carolyn about her experience, what it was like, and what it's like now. So please come back on November 6th. That should be wonderful. <laughs>